Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the uh, RSET webinar on Introduction to Remote Sensing for Disaster Management. This is week four of the series, and today's topic is going to be monitoring landslides, storms, and floods using remote sensing observation. So we have had first three weeks, we covered earthquakes and tsunamis, then wildfire. And last week, we had a oil spill session, all based on remote sensing observations. And as I mentioned, today the focus is going to be on landslides, storms, and floods. Today's agenda is going to be there are two parts. The first part is on detecting landslide from space, and we have uh, guest speaker, Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum. Uh, Dr. Dahlia Kirschbaum, she is a research scientist in NASA's Hydrological Research Lab, and she has been working on rainfall-triggered landslides and landslide modeling and hazard mapping. Uh, so she's also a lead uh, deputy scientist on GPM, which is Global Precipitation Measurement Mission um, Applied Sciences Program. And uh, Dahlia is going to talk to us about uh, how to detect and uh, landslide, as well as how to uh, have landslide modeling for forecasting probability of landslide. So without further ado, thank you, Dahlia, for taking time for this presentation. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you. It looks like we have a great turnout today. And, um, and so what I'm going to talk a bit about today is landslides, um, how, what are they, how we can measure them or estimate what's happening from space, and give you a couple resources that we've been developing through NASA to learn more about it. Um, so first, thank you so much for inviting me to speak in this series. I think it's really great um, a really great series to look at how remote sensing can be applied to disaster management. And so what I'm showing here is um, on this image, this is a view of Landsat, which is one of the satellites that has a 30 meter resolution. And what you can see right here in the middle is that there's a landslide. And this is actually the Oso Washington landslide, which was one of the most devastating landslides to hit the United States in recent decades. But I think what's important to note is I see people from all over the world and every day in fact there was just a landslide in, a day ago in Pittsburgh there's landslides that are happening in Nepal there's landslides all over the world that are happening every day they affect every country they affect every state in the United States and so I'm going to talk a bit today about what they are but also why is it so challenging to estimate and predict them so um, so what we see here this is just an example of what the same landslide was like up close. And as you can see, what this landslide has, it has a pretty large um, scarp, and it's, it's a rotational landslide that essentially mobilized and blocked a river. And we're going to talk about some of the processes in how, um, in how these work. OK, so why do we need to talk about landslides? Well, first, it's a natural erosion process, right? So when there's nobody there, it's essentially, you know, it's a mass of, of rock or debris um, earth, soil moving down a hill, and there's lots of different types. But the problem is, is, as I said, they're pervasive. They happen nearly all over the world in every country. And the reason why, you know, we're talking about this in this forum is that they have killed over 26,000 people that we know of worldwide since 20, 2007. And they can impact over, you know, 30, they can impact millions and millions of people every year. What you're seeing here is this is, is an aerial view of landslides that were triggered outside of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 2011 that, ca that caused almost a thousand fatalities just from a single rainfall event. Now, why from space? Well, NASA does a whole bunch of different things, as you've been learning about in this series. But specifically, we have a fleet of Earth science satellites designed to look at all different elements of our Earth system. And the goal for Earth science for NASA is how is the global Earth system changing and how will it change in the future? So to that end, this remote sensing gives us this vantage point of space to look at our environment in a much different way. So what I'm going to be talking about today is first giving you an overview of what we're talking about, what are the processes, 
where and when do we know about how landslides occur, how we can use remote sensing observations to estimate potential activity, and what modeling efforts are going on right now. And then lastly, where you can get more information to learn more about these hazards. All right, so I'm going to pull up the first video here, and this is Landslides 101. And so I think Brock is going to pull it over, and, and you guys can see it. So if you press, if we press play, so what you're seeing here is essentially an example of a rainfall-triggered landslide. What you can see is that the rainfall occurs, and, and you can see the bottom surface, um, let me just do a pointer here, is that you can see the, the layers beneath the surface get wet, and then it causes the soil to essentially get mobilized and either rotate or, or fall down slope. And so this is kind of a classic process. And so one of the questions we need to know is how much water is already in the soil, and then also how much water is infiltrating the soil that can cause a mobilization of the landslide. So, and all of, these, um, all of these visualizations are available free for download at any time, and I'll put the link at the end of the, of the, of the talk. So to move this back over, um, what's causing it is there's some driving forces. So when you add more water to the soil, um, it, it decreases the soil cohesion and causes the, the, um, the mass of rock to become unstable. But there's also driving forces, or resisting forces, which are, you know, um, cohesion of the surface, as well as having having um, plants, trees, really holding root zones, holding the, um, the system in place. Okay, so just to give you an example, um, if you look at a, the example of a sandcastle, um, if you ha if you're trying to build a sandcastle with dry sand, you know, and there's basically no you know water in the soil, then it basically just falls apart. Um, similarly, if you try to build a sand castle with really wet sand, it really just disintegrates if, you know, it doesn't build anything. However, if you are able to have just the right amount of water in the soil, it can actually combine together and is able to build a, a sand castle. And so that's really what happens when um, in the processes in the slope at the very microscopic scale or, or the pore pressure scale. In terms of what triggers landslides, we have both, we have rainfall events, we have earthquakes that destabilize the slope, um, we have freeze and thaw processes which really break up the, diff the soil and, um, and can cause fractures which allow water to infiltrate and, you know, basically increase um, the possibility of, of fractures caught leading to a, a massive landslide. We also have, you know, undercutting by rivers. Um, especially human development can cause or exacerbate the conditions for a landslide. So there are many different ways that landslides can affect us. Um, rock slides, for example, it can block a road. You can look at mobilization of what's called lahars, which are landslides or debris flows that can occur along volcanoes or along um, really highly mobilized surface, uh, highly, highly mobilized flows. Um, and you can have these other um, landslide type activities, which is, you know, massive debris and can cause extensive damage along infrastructure and obviously can cause fatalities. So where are we observing these events? Well, this is a catalog that we've been developing um, since 2007, and it's based primarily on media reports. And, um, and really the goal of this is to understand where and when rainfall-triggered landslides are happening. So over, right now we have over 7,000, almost 8,000 landslide reports in our system. And again, this is all from media reports. So if you look in, in general, you can see that there's some landslide hotspots. Now I mentioned that the size of the landslide um, point is actually the number of fatalities. So all of the dots with dark blue indicate areas where we've had landslides but that have not caused significant fatalities or any. So clearly there's hot spots along the Himalayan arc, along the Pacific Rim in the Philippines, areas where there's, where there's extreme topography, extreme precipitation, and often active tectonics as well that all contribute to destabilizing the slope. And in terms of our backyard, you know, I'm, I'm giving this presentation from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland. And even in the U.S., we have distributions of landslides along different areas. You can see they tend to occur along the major mountain areas, so along the Pacific Northwest, 
where we have many um, landslides in Washington, Oregon, and California, in the Rockies, as well as in the Appalachians on the East Coast. So another interesting activity with this report, with this database, and I'm going to show you where you can access it at the end, and this database is free and open to the public. So anyone has access to this information. It is the only open database for landslides, rainfall triggered landslides that is available, at least the largest that's available. So um, another thing, is, so if you look at the landslide reports, this is what we found. Um, obviously we're doing these reports in English and so the United States has the most reports because we tend to report smaller events. Um, and then India, the Philippines, and Nepal have the second, the, the second or second, third, and fourth highest number of reports. But in terms of fatalities, you can see the pattern is very different. And another pattern that we found, if you look on the left here, is the, the correlation between GDP per capita and the total fatalities for disaster for landslides. And you can see that the, as the fatalities increase in general, the level of GDP decreases. And so what this says is that while landslides happen all over the world, people that, have, that are in developing countries or with lower GDPs have, tend to have higher numbers of fatalities impact that we record in this database. Okay, so when do they happen? So, land, so rainfall is the predominant trigger of landslides around the world, and they tend to peak in the Northern Hemisphere summer. Why? Because in the Northern Hemisphere summer, we have the impact of typhoons and hurricanes, and predominantly the Asian monsoon. And so what we find is that June, July, August, September, October, mostly July, August, September, tend to be the peak for landslide activity. So we're actually just entering now the, um, the higher point of the landslide season. Okay, so how can we observe landslides? Well, there's a lot of different ways that we can observe landslides from space or from airborne sensors that can tell us about landslides in a different way than we can observe from the ground. Um, on the left, the airborne components, what you can see is aerial photos give a very detailed picture of what's happening. This is an example of landslides in China. The middle satellite imagery, some of the very high resolution commercial imagery like digital globe worldview data can give you very detailed sub-meter resolution views of where this landslides are happening. And this is the Zonggu landslide in China that really devastated an entire city. And then lastly, on the right, there's other satellite observations. Um, specifically, this is an example from the NASA Earth Observer 1 satellite, the Advanced Land Imager Instrument. And this is an example of a landslide from Indonesia with a 10 meter resolution. Now, this data is free and open to the public. Um, but obviously, you know, when we look at Landsat or we look at EO1, um, which are some of our optical sensors, Sometimes it's challenging because of the, um, the resolution of the sensors and you have to know exactly where to look. Another example of how we can observe these systems from space or observe these events from space is by looking at the difference in vegetation. So what you see on the left is this is the, a landslide that was triggered in the Langtang Valley following an extremely devastating Gorkha earthquake that was, occurred in April of 2015. And the Langtang Valley was completely or utter, almost completely destroyed by a massive landslide. So what you see here, and this is from um, the Landsat again, is that red indicates healthy vegetation, whereas you can see below um, the vegetation is completely disturbed after the landslide occurred. And it killed over 200 people in this town. So why is this information important? Well, if we know where the inf where, if we know where these landslides are happening, we can give information to authorities to better understand situationally and um, geographically where these events are happening. And so um, other ex examples of mapping in this area following the um, major earthquake were done by a team of volunteers from around the world. And we were able to collectively identify areas not only of landslides that have already happened, but of landslides that may be impacting rivers, might be causing damming of rivers that could lead to downstream effects like if the dam breaks, massive tsunamis or other impacts. So this is an example of the, this is an aerial view 
of the Lang Tang Valley. And so what you see here is, and I'm trying to get my, uh, my pointer, but what you see here is on the top, in that top dot, you can see the, um, the source area for this landslide. What happened was the debris essentially mobilized and went airborne and then fell directly onto this village and buried the village. What was really interesting in a, in a paper that was just published in Science at the beginning of this year um, that talked about this event in particular was that because the landslide was so powerful, if the area that wasn't buried in the landslide was actually completely destroyed because of the pressure of the debris falling on the landslide uh, on the surface, and that caused everything to be destroyed destroyed. And it was similar to the explosion of a nuclear bomb. That's how powerful it was. Okay. Another example I mentioned the, um, oh, thank you. Another example I mentioned was of, um, of Landsat imagery. So what you see here is the Gap landslide that dammed a lake in, um, in Nepal. And so on the right, you can see this worldview image showing um, a dammed lake and the major landslide shown in white. And then um, you can see on the left the pre-image on the bottom and the post-image on the top. You can actually see an old landslide scarp that existed, but then there was a reactivation of that landslide that uh, caused a damming of this river. So through different remote sensing sources, we're able to uncover not only what things have happened, but how they might have other Im impacts down the road or what we call cascading hazards for this area or where we might have a remobilization of debris or landslides when another um, event happens, like a major rainstorm. So one of the major concerns for this activity, for this um, area, was that the earthquake happened in April, so it happened before the monsoon. So there were many different teams of landslide experts that went into the field to look at what the impacts could be um, on areas that maybe did not have a landslide, but the slopes were weakened in such a way that a landslide was more probable. Okay, um, another example is that, you know, landslides are an erosion process, and so with worldview Im or digital globe imagery, what we see is a progression of landslides that happened subsequent to the earthquake. So first the earthquake happened and there were some events, and then as you move progressively from left to right, you're able to, so going from April all the way to May, you're able to see the impacts of how things are changing along the river. Now, this is all commercial imagery. Much of this imagery was made available through the disaster charter, which was activated, which, um, which allows the international community that's part of this to have access to data for, dis for disaster response. Um, but other imagery that's free and open, such as EO1, Landsat, or Aster, can also t give a clues into how things are evolving. Okay, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about modeling activities. So what you see here is um, a schematic of what types of satellite data we can use to really inform the landslide process. And so this is everything from soil properties or soil moisture. We have a soil moisture mission called the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission, which can look at soil moisture. We have satellites that can look at active or, free or past burned areas, which changes the morphology of the slope. It changes the composition on the slope and can exacerbate or cause more frequent landslides or debris flows in areas that have been affected by wildfires. Snow cover or snow snow cover or snow water can melt can cause can actually trigger landslides as well as the change in vegetation or forest loss and then we can look at infrastructure from different satellite imagery um, and then precipitation and slope we can also look at through satellite so this just gives you an example of the different satellite missions that we can use to uncover different elements of landslide activity. So this is the, the main point is that there are many different resources that we can use to help anticipate, predict, or observe landslides. Now, um, these are some relevant data sets that I put together, um, data sets that we used in our analysis to talk about how um, we can um, model landslide activity. And I'm sure these, these, this information, these URLs, are all active and have all have um, free and open data that can be used for analyzing landslide activities and are also relevant for flooding in many cases. So Amita, um, when she talks about flooding, these are also very relevant. 
So we've, we've used some of these data sets to put together a global landslide susceptibility map. Um, we're in just about to submit this paper, um, but if you have interest in this information, please contact me and we can, uh, we can provide um, this information to you. Um, but essentially what it does is provide a relative indication of potential landslide susceptibility at the global scale. We've also done this map over Central America and over the Himalayan region. And the idea is that you can look at landslide susceptibility from low to very low to very high and give some situational awareness of where and when or where we might have landslide activity. The when comes from precipitation for the most part. And so if we pull up the second um, example, thanks Brock, um, what you can see here, perfect, is what you're looking at hopefully is the, a global view of precipitation from the last seven days. Um, and so what you see here, this is data from the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, or GPM. And, it's an, and GPM is led by NASA and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, but it consists of a constellation of satellites designed to provide a global picture of rain and snow everywhere around the world every three hours. So what you're seeing here is the rainfall patterns essentially from the Arctic to the Antarctic Circle. And you can see that the active monsoon currently in India hitting the Tibetan Plateau. You can see some of the rainy weather we were just having on the East Coast and storms that have just affected the Midwest. Um, now this data is also freely available, in, including this visualization. And the data is available at 0.1 degree, about 10 kilometer resolution, every 30 minutes. Um, and the latency of the nearest real-time product is about five hours. So what that means is that after these storm systems come over, the, inf the data is in available for you to look at within five hours, um, which is pretty quick. And so we use this information and combine it with um, information, oh, thank you, let's move that aside, and combine it with information on, um, on susceptibility to essentially estimate where and when we might have landslides. The goal of is developing a landslide model that relies primarily on remote sensing data, primarily on open, freely available remote sensing data, to give some situational awareness of where and when landslides happen. So right here I show this kind of decision tree process that we use. We look at susceptibility, we look at antecedent rainfall, as well as daily rainfall, and are able to, um, uh, to give a sense of how things might be changing. And um, so this is one thing that a source that we can use. Um, and if you go to this URL, the Oho Streamer Heroku app.com, and you click on landslides, you have to sign in, but you're able to see landslides all over the world. And you can actually, if you sign in, you can actually download them and, um, and use them for your research, for your awareness. Um, we have other products such as rainfall and susceptibility that are also um, available to some extent. And so this system um, is, is in a prototype state, um, but currently is running at that URL. Another exciting thing, I mentioned we're doing a global landslide model. And so we're actually, this is a sneak peek of something that we're launching next month. So I highly, I would highly recommend that you take note of the URL pmm.nasa.gov. And we will have a, um, a capability to access global landslide data, the global precipitation data, um, what I did, the product I just spoke about, as well as a global flood model developed by the University of Maryland, which I'm sure Amita is going to discuss. Um, and you can access that data via API, Applications Programming Interface, um, and pull it directly. There are no restrictions. The data is free and open. And it's also available as geotiffs, um, geotiff rosters, as well as vectors. And so we're hoping that this system will greatly enhance the capability to be, to increase situational awareness around the world of potential landslide locations. Okay, this is also being run um, at a regional level. So just as an example, Centro Clima is, um, a, is an architecture that's being developed in Central America by um, what's called, called RCCP. And they are using this infrastructure to um, not only look at landslides, but also rainfall as well as other um, NASA products to understand what's happening with coffee farmers, how they might be able to better understand and prepare for any um, drought, et cetera. But there's a lot more to do. So we're making progress. Um, NASA, you know, this is one of the only global projects or products that we know of to look at landslides, and remote sensing is really the source for all of that. 
we do have several different land resources available, but landslide catalogs, I believe, remain one of the biggest impediments to improving landslide modeling. So we have a lot of different people right now. We actually have several interns this summer that are working on improving the catalog, but we very much hope soon to engage citizen scientists to contribute to this global understanding and awareness of landslides through reporting events. So I hope uh, that next time we speak or in the future, um, we will be able to come to you with a citizen science capability so that all of you can contribute to this, um, this activity. Happy to take any questions, and I'm going to turn it back over to Amita. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Delia. I really appreciate your time, and this is wonderful information. Um, as you said, uh, there are no global landslide monitoring uh, projects, and then uh, the catalog, as well as the remote sensing-based uh, landslide potential, that's going to be a great asset to the disaster management community. Um, with that, um, let's uh, focus on our next topic. Uh, that is going to be uh, storms and flooding. And um, RSET has actually conducted a number of courses on flooding. The one in, um, there are two in last two years, in 2015 and 16. One was introductory course as well as one was advanced. So we highly recommend that you visit rset.gsfc.nasa.gov to look at our past webinars. This is going to be an overview of, first of all, which remote sensing measurements are used for um, storms and flood monitoring. Um, just a moment. Yes, thank you. And then we will look at a couple of portals um, developed by NASA where hurricane and storm information is available. Uh, finally, we will have an overview of flood monitoring tools based on remote sensing observations. So to start with, we want to look at what remote sensing measurements are useful for storm and flood monitoring. Um, NASA has a suite of satellites, as we have seen earlier. And four satellites that I want to mention are, first is Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission that Dahlia also mentioned. Uh, that was launched in 1997, and it flew for more than 17 years, and it ended in April um, 2015. Also, in um, the new Global Precipitation Measurement Mission that was launched in February 2014, and that is a uh, improved uh, follow-on mission to TRIM. Um, two satellites, Terra and Aqua, which also provide uh, Earth observing system uh, satellite measurements, uh, cover more than 15 years of um, data. And so these four satellites are used uh, predominantly for both storms and uh, flood monitoring in different capacities. So a quick overview of TRIM and GPM. Um, as I said, uh, our past webinars have detailed information of both these missions, um, so please refer to those. But both TRIM and GPM are non-polar low inclination orbit satellites. That means uh, they have inclined orbits. They don't go pole to pole. Uh, TRIM covers tropical uh, latitudes, whereas GPM covers middle latitude and high latitude as well. So these two satellites uh, they were first, well, TRIM was the first one to carry a precipitation radar in space. In addition, it had two more rain, rain sensing um, instruments or sensors, uh, TRIM microwave imager and visible and infrared scanner. Um, in GPM ha has improved TMI and PR in the sense that GMI, which is GPM microwave imager, and DPR, which is dual frequency precipitation radar, they have um, uh, GMI has additional frequency compared to TMI. So that and PR, DPR also has one more frequency to uh, measure precipitation. So com combination of GMI and DPR um, not only provide because of the low inclination or the configuration provide larger latitudinal width observations in GPM. They also provide uh, more accurate measurements of snow and ice, as well as 
um, low precipitation rate, which were sometimes missed by trim, they are also captured by GPM. So this website that Talia also mentioned, pmm.nasa.gov, has a lot of information about trim and GPM, missions, sensors, their algorithms, and data. And in the application section, there are also trainings which are available to look at trim and GPM data, how to access them. What I want to draw attention to is that there are multi-satellite precipitation products available from both TRIM and GPM. So TRIM and GPM, of course, they um, are just single satellite, and they have overpasses um, which are not complete in space and time. So to improve spatial and temporal coverage, um, both TRIM and GPM use other national and international satellite measurements. They use uh, microwave radiometers and imagers and sounders from um, many satellites, as well as they also combine uh, infrared and visible uh, measurements as well. So combining multi-satellites uh, provides um, improved spatial and temporal coverage of precipitation. So TRIM has a multi-satellite precipitation data, which is uh, quite well known, and it's widely used by the application community. It is TRIM Multi-Satellite Precipitation Analysis, or TMPA. And as Talia mentioned, um, iMERGE is a similar concept. Uh, based on similar concept, iMERGE is developed uh, with a constellation of satellites, and that is integrated multi-satellite retrievals for GPM. So. TRIM TMPA, available for 17 plus years, um, has widely been used for many applications, including for storms and floods. Um, and as Delia mentioned, for landslides, also for drought monitoring. And iMERGE is going to extend uh, this product. So to summarize TMPA and iMERGE, so special resolution for TMPA is quarter of a degree, whereas iMERGE is available at one-tenth of a degree. A special coverage uh, for TMPA is 50 south to 50 north, whereas iMERGE does cover uh, 60 south to 60 north, and it will be extended from pole to pole in near future. Trample resolution for TMPA um, is three hours, and it is 30 minutes for iMERGE. Um, so here, these data are available from 1997 to present. And it is important to note that after TRIM satellite itself ended uh, in April of 2015, um, it's still TMPA is being generated using climatological calibration. And it will continue uh, until um, iMERGE has been able to cover entire period from 1997 to present. And that is likely to happen uh, sometimes in 2017, so that a high resolution precipitation data product from TRIM and GPM will be available for um, uh, long years. And they will be useful for many applications, as well as climate applications. So, in addition to TRIM and GPM, we also talk, we mentioned Terra and Aqua. Both of these satellites are polar orbiting satellites. That means they have global coverage from pole to pole, as shown here. Also, they provide uh, observations one or two times per day, uh, local time here being 10.30 AM, here 1.30 AM PM. So these are uh, twice daily measurements. Uh, they're provided. Uh, over pole to pole everywhere. Um, and they both carry a number of instruments. The one that is quite useful for both storms and flooding is MODIS. MODIS is a versatile instrument, uh, and it's a moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer. Um, what you uh, see here is that it has 36 spectral bands, covers from visible to near infrared, infrared spectrum, and has multiple channels, has multiple resolutions ranging from 250 meters to about one kilometer. 
and it provides uh, information about land, atmosphere, ocean, and cryosphere from different observations. Observations, images from MODIS are quite useful. They provide cloud information as well as about humidity information. And so just looking at images, one can see um, if there are storms present or not. And this is an example of Hurricane Katrina. And I apologize, this should be 2005. We will change that. So this was observed from Aqua Modis. And uh, you can see these are cloud cover from Modis. So just by looking at Trucar image, one can see um, where the storm is forming or how it is propagating. So for from remote sensing, um, when you think about storms, so we are going to look at first storms. What is useful is that uh, satellite images of clouds or moisture can give indication of where the storms are developing and how they are propagating, so it's easy to track. And precipitation products from TRIM and GPM, they have also been quite useful in monitoring storms. In addition, these data can be used in model assimilation, where a forecast models are used to uh, track models or derive intensity of models. So in multiple ways, remote sensing observations can be used for monitoring storms and hurricanes and typhoons. What we want to go over is the two web tools that we want to mention here. They provide information about hurricanes and storms. Uh, the first one is hurricanes and storms and web addresses given here. This provides uh, current as well as archived um, storm information. And as shown here, you can have an overview of um, hurricane research and app uh, applications. Um, also, there is images and videos available as um, one shown here. Uh, it can provide three, uh, both trim and GPN can provide three-dimensional structure of storms. So these information are available from this portal, as well as there are a number of other media resources available. So as shown here, overview contains um, hurricane archives from 2005 and present. It has links to many uh, hurricane resources about research and education. And so this is basically an information portal. Also, media resources provide links to a um, number of uh, other centers, such as National Hurricane Center, which uh, provides uh, tracking and forecasting information. Whenever there are storms uh, occurring anywhere, uh, National Hurricane Center is putting warnings out. Um, similarly, NASA's Emergency Operations Center FEMA, they all um, help in uh, early warning as well as um, monitoring of storms and hurricanes. Other uh, NASA research links are also provided here. So this portal is more of a um, monitoring and research uh, for hurricanes and storms. The other one that's available from PMM um, and that uses both TRIM and GPM. So there are archive information about storms as well as near-real-time near real monitoring from GPM is going on of uh, whenever a storm is forming. Uh, this, one, this picture here shows an example of a tropical storm Danielle forming um, in June, on June 20th of uh, this year. And so if you go to this portal, and go to Tropical Cyclone link, you will be able to see in near real time what is going on. And this is, again, based on a number of GPM precipitation products, including iMERGE. And it is the DPR that provides, and GMI that provides uh, vertical information uh, within hurricane and storms as well, which is useful for hurricane modeling um, and understanding where heating is occurring in the atmosphere that helps uh, forecast uh, intensity of hurricanes as well. So these two portals are useful for hurricane monitoring. So either use clouds or precipitation
to look at um, storms. So this brings us to overview of flood monitoring tools. Again, there are three types of flood monitoring tools that we want to look at today. Uh, the first one actually that derives stream flow and runoff from a hydrologic model and that is driven by observed rainfall. Uh, so in this case, remote sensing of uh, rainfall is quite useful in driving a hydrologic model and that provides information about flooding. The second um, type is that flooding is inferred from precipitation. So based on satellite values and based on statistical relationship between observed flooding and uh, precipitation, uh, there is a inference that whenever there is extreme precipitation, there will be probability of flooding. And that has that is a second type of flooding tool. The third one is, is actually detecting um, water over dry land or land which was previously dry. So this looks at land cover and then decides whether any land is flooded which was not previously flooded. So we are going to look at examples of these three types of tools. They provide near real-time information about flooding in various ways. So the first two which are based on rainfall, uh, the one is that Dahlia also mentioned is Global Flood Monitoring System that is from University of Maryland. And the other one is Extreme Rainfall Detection System that is a Ithaca web. This is supported by um, FAO. And so these two, they use shrimp precipitation currently and they will soon be using um, GPM precipitation to do the same. So here is GFMS and EARDS2, they, um, they use TMPA so far. So everything you, you will see on this tool website, and as we will see in a minute, is based on TMPA. But soon, as soon as the iMERGE avail is available and long-term records are available combining TMPA and iMERGE, these tools will uh, potentially use that uh, new product uh, that is combining uh, trim and GPM. So GFMS, Global Flood Monitoring System from University of Maryland. So this, based on TMPA, provides flooding information between 50 South and 50 North. Here's the website and here is the um, interface. As soon as you enter the website, you will see which shows flood detection intensity or depth above threshold in millimeter. So not only this information is available, the website also provides instantaneous rainfall every three hourly based on uh, TMPA. Also, it provides maps of accumulated rainfall over 24 to 72 hours and 168 hours, which really gives indication of flooding. And then stream flow information or uh, rates are provided at 12 kilometer resolution. So all these information are routinely available at 12 kilometer resolution and are also available at one kilometer information in uh, near real time for current months. So in when you go to this website, web tool, it is easy to navigate and see where the flooding is going on. Um, all, the all the green to red areas, they indicate flooding because that's where the depths of or the stream flow values, they exceed flood uh, stream flow value. So they, uh, there's a threshold that is used to decide um, whether it's going to be flood it's flooded or not. And the strength is given by this color bar here. In this, one can zoom into anywhere using um, zoom in and zoom out and pan the map by using the arrows. So go up, down, uh, left, and right. Uh, there is also a facility to choose time here. Um, this archives are available uh, uh, starting in 2000. Uh, and then it, it will be available in near real time. Right now at three hourly, 
time step. Eventually, it will be half hourly time step. And by you can look at animation of how stream flow is changing. Also, you can click on any point, or you can enter um, latitude and longitude and time that you are interested in to look at how stream flow or flood depth is changing at any one point. So to, to show an example, this is a, a flooding event that uh, is occurring right now in Niger River uh, in Africa. And what you see here is that um, flood depth is above threshold. And when you zoom into this area, you can see individual 12 kilometer area in this. And by clicking on any one 12 kilometer area, you can get a plot of how a flood detection, flood detection or intensity or depth above threshold changes over time. So one can see when flooding is maximum and when the flooding is going down based on this intensity. So uh, this is a versatile tool that provides stream flow and runoff information in uh, over global area based on trim also can be zoomed in and looked at any area closest to where you have um, either a dam or urban area or important infrastructure where you want to monitor flood intensity. This tool can be quite useful. So that brings us to the second tool, which is Extreme Rainfall Detection System. This uses trim to infer to flooding. And what this has basically is a uh, uses trim. It has one more feature that it uses NOAA's global forecasting system model and uses that rainfall as well to provide um, forecast for next 24 to 72 hours of where flood might be occurring. So this tool does not actually provide stream flow or any quantitative information, but it provides alerts or warnings based on threshold put on uh, rainfall values themselves and uh, forecast model rainfall as well. So it provides information in terms of 24-hour um, to 144-hour alerts. Um, currently, if you go to this website, you will see areas where there is flooding likely. And clicking on that, you can see whether it is a low, medium, or high alert for flooding to occur. It also has information about uh, parcel tile rainfall changes over time based on trim as well as GFS. And it also has information about the affected population in this area or potentially how, how much population can be affected um, that is available. And this is just uh, one example um, that we have from a few days ago that uh, provided um, alerts over uh, South America where flooding is likely. And uh, this tool is currently used by UN World Food Program uh, and for emergency preparedness. Uh, this tool also will be transitioning to GPM uh, when uh, combined TMP and IMERGE data are available. So this is just um, showing what kind of uh, alerts are available. Uh, and this example is for the 72-hour alert in, in Metar River in Colombia. This was uh, just the 27th of June. Um, and it also um, talks about how much population is affected uh, in this area. So that is available by clicking on, on, on the link for the flooding. So that, that, sh that shows maximum uh, precipitation value as well as in this um, time period, as well as um, potential, potentially how many uh, people can be affected by this flood event. So this helps um, emergency preparedness. This brings us to another flooding tool. And so the one GFMS and ERDS use rainfall information. The third one that uses MODIS uh, information, MODIS provides land cover information. And based on that, uh, one can decide 
that previously dry land now has water on it, and that helps mapping inundation. So there are two tools that use this information. One is MODIS Near Real-Time Global Flood Mapping, available at this web address. The other one is Dartmouth Flood Observatory, which basically uses the same information, but it has also some additional information uh, associated with each flood event. So we'll briefly have a review of these two tools. So MODIS of uh, Flying on Terran Equa, uh, you can see example here. This is uh, from the past. But this is um, a Nile River in Sudan. And you can see from Aqua here, you don't see uh, that much flooding here. The land cover changes, and you can already see that there is flooding occurring. So reflectance are measured by MODIS, especially in band 1, 2, and 7. They help in deciding where uh, uh, there is water on previously dry land. And so there is a global reference database of water available from MODIS at 250 meters. And then on top of that, these reflectances are used daily to see, uh, compared to this reference data set, where there is water, where there was no water previously present. One drawback of MODIS is that it cannot see through clouds. So when a lot of clouds are present, MODIS is unable to see the surface. So sometimes what happens is when there's a lot of rain and flooding going on, one cannot see directly underneath um, those clouds through MODIS, but it can see surrounding inundated area where there are no clouds present. Or after a storm passes through, when there is still inundation going on, MODIS can see. So this is quite useful for post-flooding management. So just to review MODIS NRT and its features, uh, this is the website. It provides information on 10 degree by 10 degree tile. This is available at 250 meters resolution. So what it provides is permanent water maps. And on top of that, it provides information about where the flooding is occurring. A number of parameters are available. So flood maps are available um, as uh, images. Uh, flood water that is available in shapefile or as KMZ uh, file, which is Google Earth importable. Uh, surface water um, or reference water that is available um, in shapefile as well. And then water products are available as GeoTIFF. Basically, these water products are available as GeoTIFF. Another feature is that uh, it's easy to um, track flooding. There are past 10 days slideshow. One can see these images to see how flood changed in any particular area. So on the website itself, um, one can choose by clicking on any 10 degree by 10 degree grid, and then go to um, the calendar to choose which time to look at. And there are composite maps available, so three-day composites all the way to 14-day. So three-day is the default um, version. And if it is too cloudy, then compositing over 14 days it helps to eliminate or minimize uh, that cloud impact so that you have general idea where flooding occurred in the last uh, 14 days or so. Um, this provides convention about file name if you want to uh, download and use the, fly, uh, the file data files themselves. But generally, pictorially, if you go and pick any area on the map, and if you zoom in by clicking on it, the red areas here, they mark inundation. And one can see that the water body are shown here. This is again in Colombia. And you can see that outside where the um, areas are flooded or inundated can be seen by MODIS. So combining GFMS to look at stream flow um, within the channel and then MODIS inundation occurring around the streams both of them can be used together for effective flood management. 
And uh, this is a 14-day uh, composite map, which shows more like percent percent of um, days which were flooded in last 14 days. So that's based on three-day composite products for last 14 days. So information is slightly different, but it provides general area which are, are flooded uh, due to heavy rainfall. Also, one thing to notice is that uh, it provides information about where the, where the clouds are present. Uh, here there are clouds present so that you don't see underneath. It also provides reference water. Um, and it provides any urban area uh, marked as well. So an, a lot of information is available for uh, flood management. This brings us to Dartmouth Flood Observatory, which is also using uh, MODIS information. But in addition, it uses um, high resolution Landsat 8 and Earth Observing Satellite 1 images, also Cosmos SkyMeet and Sentinel uh, synthetic aperture radar images whenever they are available. And it also has an experimental river discharge um, facility that is using microwave satellite data from earlier from TRIM, now from uh, GPM, also from um, a Japanese satellite that provides advanced microwave sounder. So this provides near real-time flood mapping from MODIS. In term, wherever the flooding is occurring, you can click. Also, there is a catalog of flood starting from 1980s that is available on the website. When you go to any flood event, you will see a number of things. And this is an example of Texas flood, heavy flooding that occurred in June 2015. What you would see in red is the area which are flooded. These are based on um, MODIS 14-day composites. There are light red areas. They show flooding during this event, but which covered, which was occurring earlier than today. Dark blue is the permanent water or reference water. Dark red small areas you will see are based on Landsat or any other available SAR data. So these are high resolution uh, within um, this area. And then the bright green areas you see, they um, show area where these were flooded previously in previous years. So by looking at this any event, one can quickly study flood prone areas now or where there was flooding in the past so that that you can apply same strategy for flood management now or in the future. Also, you might see a colored dot. These are the sites which provide experimental river discharge. And they use, as I mentioned, um, microwave information from a number of satellites and a hydrologic model, as well as river gauging station, combine this to come up with mean runoff. And then based on that, a river discharge uh, is actually calculated and provided. So all the dots shown here are uh, gauged at surface as well as gauged from satellite from DA4 using microwave information. And clicking on any one point provides information um, multiple information. One can go to BFO and look at accumulated rainfall from TRIM and GPM. Also, one can see where the flooding is occurring in red. Uh, going into river discharge point, one can see, so these one of these points, one can see uh, over time how actually discharge changed. Um, and this is based on, on micro measurements as well as a hydrologic model. So this is, again, how some more quantitative information is added to the MODIS-based inundation mapping. So both these tools are quite useful for flood um, early warning and flood management, also post-flood uh, relief operations to see where um, flooding 
it's still going on. Inundation is still there even after the storm passes. So combining uh, multiple satellites as data as well as tools, uh, there is effectively storms and flood can be monitored and strategy to do management or, or relief operations can be devised. And so this summarizes all the tools that we saw today uh, based on trim and GPM rainfall measurement as well as MODIS land cover uh, measurement. So with that, is, um, this brings ends to today's uh, webinar as well as this is the last session in this webinar series. Also, all our presentations and recorded sessions are available from the website as well. And so thank you very much for attending this session. And um, uh, if you have any questions, especially for Dahlia, thank you for staying. Uh, she can answer your questions about landslides and uh, anything about storms and flooding.